with Mass and Space Systems, uh, with the Space Frontier Foundation, uh, with all of you. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different. We had a whole lot of topics that we wanted to talk about, and three days may be too much for some people, but for us, we wanted to keep talking about stuff forever. So while well, we were drafting things to talk about, we kind of realized, well, let's find out where you are as we get to the end of the, of the conference and figure out what do we not get? What's, what's missing? What are the things that we could still cover? Any of the three of us are more than happy to talk for hours, and some are really good at talking for hours. But so the, the question is, what are the things, you, you've heard three days of space business and, and three days of what actions are going on to advance the human settlement of space. So as we wrap up, what are the things that are still outstanding? What did you, what did you not get? What's the thing that you're, that's holding you back from jumping in or from doing something? Anyone who wants to, throw, give, me, give us something to, to go to our, our esteemed panel with. Space debris. You didn't hear enough about space debris. Everybody, everybody talks about how it's a problem, but no one really talks about the solution. Space debris. Problem, not a problem. What do you think? Rick, is space debris a problem? Yes, but it's also an opportunity. Oh, so very happy. Sure. It's an opportunity. That's great. It's an opportunity for what? Well, I think, um, first of all, there, there's a lot of compli complicated issues involved with space debris, um, especially when you get into like the size of it. So for example, if, uh, if space debris is identifiably still part of a spacecraft, then according to the United Nations, it's still under the responsibility of the launching nation. And until we work out a way for that to be able to be handed off in some form as uh, um, uh, Who's you know, paying recyclable for or whatever, um, then that, that has to be worked out. Right? So we have legal issues. Now, when it gets smaller, um, then it's also, it gets into being harder to find, harder to get to. There's this idea, um, and I've had this idea early on, too, you know, that we could fly around and just scoop it up, but there's this little problem called orbital mechanics. Changing inclinations, changing altitudes, etc. This is very expensive stuff. Uh, and then you're dealing with something that's kind of going really fast. But, you know, in the end, we want to protect Sandra Bullock. And so, you know, yeah, we have to look at it. When, when is it an opportunity? When is space debris going to be a business opportunity? So I think it already is. I think there are uh, there are a couple places where entrepreneurs, whether they are policy entrepreneurs or business entrepreneurs, get into it. Um, and I think that y you also have to consider what is the potential role of the government and which is the potential uh, agency of the government that you want to do it. And that gets into potential you know, lawfare, uh, legislative shaping that you might want to do. So you know, the uh, small debris is not going to go away unless we have a technical program to get rid of it. And it's large debris, I think we are sort of we're on track. We're going to have space tugs and, and robots with space arms, and uh, people will be innovating in, in business models. And I think there's, I think the right business model, or I think a starting place for a business model would be that you have an additional protocol to the Outer Space Treaty that essentially actuarializes the risk of every single piece of space debris and its owner in such a way that nobody wants to own the space debris. They all want to give it to some kind of commodity exchange uh, or some kind of uh, uh, international uh, body or public-private partnership that serves as a middleman to say, hey, you know, would you want to get rid of that for me? And so if all the countries don't want to own the actuarial risk, and if you can imagine something like a, uh, like a carbon credit system where we say every year we're going to take 10 tons and we're going to take them out of the worst orbits, um, that, that that's the type of incentive system that would rapidly create a business opportunity for people who would service that need. So the investable space debris company is one that has the head of state of a bunch of different countries as the founding member? Like, where is the innovation? It sounds to me like you're saying the innovation is, is, is in policy. It's not in technical. I, I think the innovation, y yes. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, it's today, right? 
you have to get the permission of a state who owns that registered object to touch it. And so, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't get that, like the United States can't go up and move out a failed rocket body that belongs to the former Soviet Union. Uh, we would have to get their permission. And then on the way down, you assume risk because once you touch it, right? So there needs to be a, a legal innovation that creates an incentive structure that states who are the owners of this legally uh, want to cooperate and businesses within those states, because there will be national laws, also want to cooperate. And then you have to consider the reality that anything that can deorbit space debris is a dual use item that's going to be sensitive. For big stuff, it's going to be a robot that can deorbit stuff. And that's going to be, people are going to worry about that as an anti satellite weapon. For small stuff, it's going to have to be a laser that vaporizes it or pushes it back into orbit. And that's going to be sensitive. So, so you've in, got in either case, you you might think about an initial, some kind of a, an initial government structure that's going to be multinational, and you probably don't want it led by any of the major powers. That might be something that Luxembourg or UAE, or, or one of the middle powers like Canada, could take on in terms of f forming something like a commsat for space debris deorbit. So, well, go ahead. I'm oh. hoping you're an attorney and a international negotiator, um, and space debris, an excellent topic, and recommendation to talk more about it in the future. Rick's going to say something else real quick. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to disagree with my Thank good you. friend here in a small way, only in a small way. Because I think if, if one adopts the ethos, the, the conceptual framework of way the, the way the future should roll out in space, that is sort of at the heart of the Space Frontier Foundation. And those of us who see space as a frontier, you will never de-orbit anything. It is against the ethos of the frontier to bring things back down, reuse, recycle, repurpose. That's it. Um, so using the same, everything else you said except the de-orbit part. Yep. Right? And it was funny because while you're talking, somebody put this on. I thought it was something deorbiting and flaming. I, that, I realized, oh, it's a fire. It was but a fire seriously, side chat, so. nothing should ever be brought back down, especially buildings or anything large. So, I mean, on that note, just to make a final point, you know, the, part of it is that the, the problem that we are going to have is the many on many conjunction problems. Mm -hmm. But easier than deorbiting may be just aggregating things into closer and you know you could imagine let's just consolidate garbage you know cans and later on yep. somebody will put an option on that you know but to do that there's going to have to be a, an, an ability and who knows maybe we'll blockchain every one of those little pieces of and allow for the for the trading of of space debris sorry i'm gonna but, roll my eyes so hard i fall off the chair no blockchain is great keep going we love the blockchain. yeah i know you do well, let's go to another question but there'll be a junkyard Yes, that's what we're talking about. Many. Yeah. My name is Steve. Is this on? Yep. Okay. Yep. My name is Steve Garf. I'm from Kitsap Aerospace and Defense. Uh, I've heard a lot about big data coming down and being useful. Uh, in my travels through uh, remote Africa, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs there. And so we bypassed the landlines in Africa and we've gone straight to cell phones. And uh, I'd like to hear more about 10 years from now and how isolated villages in third world countries are going to, I believe, have a much improved life because they're going to be able to use this data. They're going to be able to become much more entrepreneurial on a larger scale. So I'd like your thoughts on that. Pete, first of all, tell them who you are. OK. So I am very recently retired uh, a strategist and educator for the Air Force on long-term space strategy. So I used to run our, uh, the Air Force's Space Horizons program and, and helped initiate our Shriver Scholars uh, program that is, uh, I think, uh, really building a cadre of, of military space officers that understand the gravity of what your community is doing. Uh, you know, they start off reading Gerald O'Neill's High Frontier. They start off reading um, uh, uh, 
and of course I'm going to slip. Uh, the man who sold the moon? No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, uh, not Rocket Barons, the other one about uh, Space Barons. Space Barons, right? So they're exposed to a different form of thinking so that they can contextualize uh, military power in the context of what hopefully will be a, a multi uh, trillion dollar space economy. And of course, why do we want a multi-trillion dollar space economy at all? Uh, we want it because it, it's ultimately going to better the lives of not only the, the people that live today, but hopefully the unbelievably vast expansion of human beings that will live in the future. And like you, I think that the democratization of access to information and we're talking about all kind, all forms, right? Because the moment you can plug into the astronet, you know, the moment you've got access to all the other minds, all that stored knowledge, all the amazing amount that we can know about ourselves and others, we're going to be adding two billion more people uh, to that thought pool, and that's very exciting. And that sort of gets us to the larger question of space settlement, which is. Why don't we keep at it? You know, why not have several trillion people in the solar system, and eventually move out beyond that? You know, why? Th that is an amazing future, and it's a it's a fundamental. You know, for me, this is a question of what is the destiny of life? The destiny of life is to spread to every place, to turn every dead rock into something beautiful and green and thriving. Rick, I don't know how you managed to reach over and make him say that. It sounds like something that would come from you. <laughs> um, to directly address your, your question, I think one of the great challenges that we're going to be facing as we open the frontier, and I, I'm sorry I'm not a, uh, a communications and earth observation person. Um, I, I, it's just not my thing. And, and um, I'm into it as long as it helps increase the number of payloads that then decreases the cost of going into space. But let's, I want to jump a little into more deeply what is in there in your question in terms of places like Africa. And how do we, um, in, in the, the space nations and the space very community, try uh, and bring them in and bring them along? Because I, you know, I just don't buy this thing that you know, you're like, uh, I, I've seen it so many times, speak a lot, you know, in different countries. And there's this idea that you're not one of the big guys, so, um, you know, maybe someday you'll fly a couple of CubeSats and you'll be able to, you know, follow your crop rotations from space or something like that. And, you know, you're, you don't have any, you're not playing in the big game, right? Um, and I think we really have got to, to work on that. Now, uh, technology is helping us with the, the, in, the advent of the CubeSats and, and things like that. But we're really going to have to make sure, the, the space-faring nations, that, um, that we uh, lean, lean out, lean back, lean sideways. I don't want to infer any direction here. But that we make sure that, uh, I mean, Africa is, is completely absent, in a sense, in terms of, of opening the frontier right now. And I think that's going to have to, to take some direct action on the part of the space nations to bring them in. I'm, I'm really lucky. I just got invited to, key, to do a keynote in Monaco uh, at, a, at a conference for African family offices. So I can tell you for the next few months before we lead up to that conference, it's going to be in my brain. You know, how, do we, how do we frame that? How do we get them involved? I actually think it's going to come much faster. Than, I think Africa in particular is going to come much faster than most people estimate. I, uh, four years ago, I was uh, part of a United Nations mission in Mali to stabilize. And the, the rate of change, you know, it, you're starting from such a low level that, that it's difficult to appreciate, right? But I mean, everybody is getting internet and cell phones now. And that is totally changing their financial transactions, their ability to know things. And that, that's going to accelerate. There are already you know, interesting business accelerators, interesting TED Talks on this. I think uh, I, I at least know that there are, there's an African Union uh, space agency agreement. There are several African nations that already have space agencies. 
and the fact that India and China are playing a very aggressive game to use uh, partnerships to, to grow their own national power and prestige is gonna mean that, that the, the rate that they're going to be able to move is gonna be much faster. And I think what, you know, people look at Africa and they think it's on a linear scale, and it's not. You know, it, it's compound interest. And I think we're all gonna be surprised at how significant a force that continent becomes um, in, in the global economy period. Yeah, they've got one thing, great thing going for them. They've got the equator. So I, I'm, I'm, I would look forward to seeing some African launch facilities. So picking up some conversation about not just non-US, but really looking at where space and the advancement of a human settlement of space is going to have major impact. That's, a, that's another great one to, for us to fold in for the conversation next year. Speaking of next year, what have you heard enough about? And I mean, had enough. Don't want to hear it anymore. And we may be asking the wrong folks, because if that's they've right. heard enough. I'll go. I, I, OK. No. You can never get enough, Rick. Thank you. What are the things that you're kind of done with? CubeSats. CubeSats are done with no longer the frontier. What else? What are some things that just kind of like? Love everything. All right, just remember, it's everything nice. we talk about is going to be bumping something out. Let me flip the question then. As we, as the Space Frontier Foundation, try to lead the industry, the world, to advance the human settlement of space, we've said commercialization is one of those things that has to happen. If I ask Rick, he will recite the credo line and verse. And so we have focused on commercialization. Most of this has been about commercialization and unlocking potential, bringing the free enterprise. That's great. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. And we, we know we need to move forward, but as we've commercialized, what are we leaving behind? What are the, the, the rocks that are in our commercialization path right now that are going to get in the way of settlement of space? The government. It's a great big freaking boulder. Um, and, um, but I thought you guys changed the government. I've heard the stories. You changed the government. You led the revolution. You said, hey, guys, there's a better I, way. I'm not the one who put we won on the website. Um, <laughs> no, we haven't won. Um, we've had wins. We've had a lot of wins. And by the way, there are a lot of great people, in, especially and in, interestingly, uh, like there was just this event in the State Department. Um, they're waking up to that there's something going on, and they want to be a part of it, and they want to help make it happen. Uh, the current administration, for all the differences that I have, and they are very dramatic differences with much about what they're going doing, um, have enabled a new conversation to occur about space and, and the private sector, and that's great. Um, we still have this incredibly schizophrenic disconnect between the SLS Orion existing and the private sector. Yes, we do. Okay, it, it doesn't make any sense. History will look back at that as it doesn't make insanity. sense. It makes perfect sense. You know that it makes sense. I'm calling you. I'm calling BS. Sense for who? It makes perfect sense. Okay. Go we know. On. We know why the system is the way the system is, mm -hmm. because of the incentives and the players that are in the game. So it right. makes perfect sense. We may not like the sense, but it makes sense. It depends on where you sit uh, in terms of the word sense. Fair enough. I'm I didn't gonna, say reason. Gonna, yeah. I said sense. OK. Well, we're getting in semantics here. Um, I think the, the, the existence, uh, at the same time that we're supposedly going to the moon rapidly in a way that is supposed to be economically sustainable. As it was said, we'll do it. Got uh, it. Of, at the same time, of the SLS Orion system is oxymoronic. Um, yes, it exists to keep the pork barrel full. It exists to feed constituencies. It exists to uh, maintain this sort of uh, psychology uh, that has dominated the core government NASA program since the Apollo program. Um, but it doesn't make sense in terms of achieving a goal. I'll buy uh, Bob Zubrin um, says it, and God forbid, don't tell Bob I'm actually... <laughs> You know, paraphrasing him, he's a, he's a good friend, but you know, he has this great statement where he says that um, the human exploration part of NASA uh, spends money to do things, and that the human spaceflight part of NASA does things to spend money. money. 
Um, and, and that just doesn't work. All right, so step one, we'll get rid of the government. Step two, P, so, what's the next? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> just a second before you get that. Uh, no, I'm not saying get rid of the government. We need regulation. We need structure. We just need a little bit of sanity tied to it and a shared belief and uh, motivation to achieve economic goals. But I don't want to give her, I'm not an anarchist. Gave him the opportunity. So, Sorry. you know, I, <laughs> I have not had the amazing experience of being a private sector entrepreneur, but I understand your frustration having been an entrepreneur. But what I would say is that uh, if you start with a boulder, uh, you, you have to look at the government policy and legal structure uh, as a sculptor, right? You, you're going to have to carve out and make it what you want to be, and it's going to be a lot of work over time. But uh, I, I have a bit of a, um, an, an artistic uh, disposition, and the, the medium I like to work with is bureaucracy. I like to, to shape and cajole and eventually get it closer to, to, the, to the sculpture that I think it should be. Um, I'm happy to take questions because I am very much attempting to sculpt um, a, a, a new uh, pro-space development protection of space commerce military arm of your government that would be directly responsible to you, that would, in theory, uh, uh, be an amazing business opportunity for you, but more than that would protect the freedom of commerce. That is a very tough game right now. Uh, but I think that uh, you know this is the time for this community to engage in offensive lawfare. You have to know what you want, and you have to get in there and help the right law and policy to happen. And let me just point out, there is no real national policy for space development or for space settlement, right? We have a rogue US agency NASA that is incapable of actually reading their constitutive document and what they're supposed to be doing in terms of development and has resisted anything other than you know being in front when that is certainly not what our community is looking for NASA to do right we want them to be you know like DuPont used to say you know we, we don't make things we we make everything better right to to seed that and uplift that and until some tectonic shift happens and we stop talking, uh, it, maybe it isn't that we stop talking about it, right? But exploration is not the right word for this generation. This generation, the right word is development. If we do what is in our power to develop space, the potential for exploration is amazing. You just think about, like, if I were spending the money I'm spending now to mass produce, like, explore what I could be doing in terms of just massive knowledge of the, of the solar system. Or if I were choosing instead of a $43 billion development effort on an expendable rocket, that's like 244 Falcon Heavies. You know, what an amazing space program you could have launching 66 tons, you know, 244 times at a tenth the cost probably. So, but that, you know, is being driven by a top misunderstanding of what the new space race is about. The new space race isn't about being somewhere first or doing something first or even prestige, right? It's about development and economic power and how you structure that and whether or not that's going to be decided by free peoples. But that's not what's in the conversation. It's not what's in the that's conversation not, at not, all. Look, nobody said, oh my gosh, look at that. Elon just made so much money from parking his car in orbit. No one said, that's the cool thing. That's not the conversation. It's the rocket. It's so, the flash. So, so here's the problem, right? We have tolerated for decades a discussion on destination. Uh, when, when I was first baptized with what you said, the broadest thing I was able to conceive of, the broadest, the most ambitious space program I thought a nation was capable of was putting boots on Mars and planting a flag. And now I'm like, that's not even worthy of America. That's something for a billionaire to do. We need to be building 
you know, a ring of solar power satellites of 50 terawatts of green energy, mining the moon, sending our stuff out to the satellites, scale, scale, not doing it again, not doing it two times, a thousand, a million, a trillion times the scale that was Apollo. That's a dream that's worthy of the United States and its partners. And that's where we should be leading to, a vision of the future that is so powerfully good for humanity that it just dwarfs all this. If we have an infrastructure that can build 50 terawatts of green energy with lunar resources, which by the way is the, the PRC's plan, if we do that, sending somebody to Mars or sending an interstellar probe is just marginal. It's just extra budget dust on top of what exists that we're paying for in consumer lights. We, there's no way that we can afford the scale of space uh, uh, the scale of the space program on public dollars that we as consumers could potentially put up there with just our consumer demand for energy. It is many orders of magnitude difference. We um, as geeks have a tendency to argue about technologies. Uh, 1988, uh, Steve Wolf, uh, the staffer for Congressman George Brown was able to Pass, and this was my baptism where I got to learn about the walking in the halls of Congress. I was uh, kind of furloughed from Dr. O'Neill's Space Studies Institute to work with Steve in Washington. Passed the Space Settlement Act of 1988. It basically codified that the goal of the human spaceflight program of the United States was human settlement. The administrator at the time, a guy named Dan Golden, hated it, put one of his staffers, a, a, a woman named Lori Garver, on the job of, of, of keeping it down because, God forbid, the aerospace industrial complex, which was feeding, actually have metrics towards a goal that it be measured against. And they didn't want that because it didn't fit their agenda. Um, and what was interesting was the space community itself, us, National Space Society, the other organizations that were out there, rather than going and, and grabbing that because we had it, it was signed into law. We spent the next few years arguing about launch vehicles. Uh, I think it was the EEX, Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle, or something like that. It was, you know, pick your launch vehicle debate of choice, and, and that was what the fight was. In the meantime, by the time, as time passed, um, Clinton Gore came in, and they had a thing called the Paperwork Reduction Act, and NASA happily said, oh, there's some extra paper here, get rid of this one. And it was eliminated. And there wasn't a peep from the space community. Nobody said anything. Not even you? No, nope, not even me. No, I was caught up in the fight. There, I think there's a real lack of class consciousness yeah. of ours to, to care about this larger vision. You know, like, this is about a national purpose. And, and I realize this is an international conversation here. Um, but maybe most of us are Americans here. And in that national purpose, the United States has always tried to provide a structuring role where everybody can go. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's just, we are, we are decades overdue for a deep conversation on national purpose. It is just, it is, and it results in deeply unsatisfying things, right? So even though we have really moved the needle, right? I mean, and I do want to applaud NASA for the, the right things that they've done, you know, the, the uh, CLIPS is a brilliant move, right, mm -hmm. that we want to see. COTS yeah, is the, the right commercial thing, right? Lunar but, payload but service. All, all those are the, are the right moves. But, you know, when somebody like me reads the administration's tasking to NASA, mm -hmm. and they say, lead a commercial and international thing to provide the sustained presence, right? That doesn't mean NASA gets there first and all of you help lift NASA up. That means NASA structures the market for something at scale. That means NASA starts the conversations with commerce and FAA and State Department to say this is the industrial park. These are the metrics. This is how much lunar propellant but we're going to have. But that's how you hear it. That is how I hear it. That is not how I'm NASA pretty sure. Hears it. I'm pretty sure, because I know who wrote it, that I that's know. what they meant. That's what they meant.
But the distance between the voices of sanity and NASA's ears is probably much greater than but that. Communication is more than just saying it. You've got to you've you've say, yeah. you've you've got got to say it multiple it. times. Now, real quick, I, I do want to finish sure. my statement there on, 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 on about the settlement thing. First of all, I'm not sure that I didn't say anything, but I've got to look, I look it up. So I'm going to go for the negative and, and, and <laughs> said. But the other thing that did happen was in 2015, we got the word settlement agreed to by a lot of people in D.C. And then... Um, Several groups got together, carried that forward. Tony DeTora, former executive director of Space Frontier Foundation, and, and others worked on the Hill. And they got the word settlement into the NASA Authorization Act. It made it through both houses of Congress. It got into the committee where they were hammering around the final language. And right at the end, again, approved by both committees, it's in there. And a staffer, I think, from uh, Lamar Smith's office, um, went in and, and said, yeah, we don't like that settlement word, and it went away. Let's talk about why that word is important, right? Words really matter. Mm -hmm. And settlement is totally different than habitation or uh, I forget what the current extending human presence, right? Presence. That, that's different. Settlement means children. It means you go there to live. And if that's your goal, right, continuous occupation of Leo is one thing, but settlement means that you can stay there. And you can be on a path, as we are on ISS now, where you never get to testing rotational gravity. You could be doing much more to see you know, what is possible for human reproduction. And you're thinking about scale, right? It's a, this is why I, I worry about the future of NASA, because Elon has put out such a compelling vision of a city on Mars which is settlement. And that's so much bigger than anything that could be conceived of by a government agency. If you don't have settlement, and I actually think it's settlement needs to imply much more. People tend to think about, OK, settlement, if I, wanna, if I want to support one human being, I need all this other stuff. I think the reality is, is that one human being supports these many millions of biodiverse species of fungi and bacteria and plants and animals. We are the life carriers of Earth life. Mm -hmm. When we go, it's not just us. It is the entire green Earth going with us. And every human being we put enables not just us. We are going to take the whole diversity of life with us into any place we take our, our civilization. And the bar and what that drives in technology, that word settlement, is so much more ambitious than sustained human presence. And it drives in a very different way this, OK, well, what does sustainable on the moon mean? If, if sustainable means we want an Antarctic station where we go every once in a while, that's one thing. If the goal of human settlement is we're going to have trillions of people living and working in our solar system and beyond. Moon is the place to start figuring that out. Mm -hmm. That generates an entirely different program of what you are researching and what gets priority. And let me point out, it's not science. Science enables, and you will be funding science, right? But it's not science for science sake. This is a purpose, a purpose of why you are conducting that. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, you've got this tyranny of uh, uh, this tyranny of curiosity where science is the driver of everything that NASA is doing as opposed to science in the service of a grand destiny for Earth life and humanity as its carriers. And a follow-up to that is a question here, and I'm sure he's got, you know, his, his, he wants to go take that fungi to space. So, all right, what we threw a bunch of questions out, and I think we may have answered one so far. So, what what thing were you, what what question are you answering or asking? So, I, who are you? My name is Todd Youngblood. I'm uh, director of technology at Space for Humanity. Um, so, I, I really like this conversation, and I, I really like this audience. Thanks, Lotus. Number one, we get no bonus, but yeah, do it. Okay. Space is a really interesting topic because it, it it's an intergenerational topic, it's an intercultural topic, it's an international topic, and it really holds a, a special place within, within humanity and society. Um, I, I've, I've heard it come up a few times over the conference that technology is, is an opportunity, and, and technology, specifically like the blockchain uh, and cryptocurrencies, if 
I've heard it said that if they're not implemented, they're, uh, your, your company's not going to be around in a few years. And to me, there's an opportunity there because space is also very dependent on trust, both international trust and interpersonal trust. And to me, growing up and, and living in a life of software, I see um, emerging technologies like, like the blockchain as being a, a codified representation of trust. And so, to me, I, I see there being this opportunity of utilizing technology almost as a bridge and using space as a bridge because, I mean, up until this conference, I haven't really heard of a good application or, or the utilization of, of the blockchain, and this is coming from financial services, until I heard about the marriage of space and blockchain. Mm -hmm. So, there's some, there's some interesting emerging research coming out of the Open Data Institute about uh, data trusts. And is there an opportunity to, to create a space trust where we're tracking stuff like space debris and, and using the data of that debris as the basis or, or, or asset um, of these trusts? And, and could that be a bridge that allows us to actually start creating an international conversation about space data and then, I don't know, maybe, maybe use it as a stepping point from there? Rick, do you know, have you done any work on blockchain? <laughs> Oh, man, I'm, this, this is a joke for blockchain people, but I've been climbing the Merkle tree, um, which is a, a term they use. Um, I, I was can, so proud. Can we issue a token to, to give us a three-minute answer? Is yeah, that how that works? Very funny. Um, look, I, I think that, yes, first of all, in the financial side, the security tokens, the, the fractional ownership, things like that that can, that can be done using the open ledger technology of, of, of blockchain is, is great. We're, we're, we're going to apply it in, in space fund. Um, we have to, we actually realize in space fund, we have to be cautious about that because in some sectors, they're, they're still suspicious. You know, oh, it's that Bitcoin thing or whatever, and, and you don't want to pile a new on top of a new. On the other hand, whenever I go in front of blockchain audiences, um, it works beautifully because they're, they're, they're already future oriented revolutionary space geeks. And, and they're already into it, and they already understand what we're talking about. The applications, which you know, in, in terms of blockchain, that are anything from fractional ownership to the democratization of decision making, to actual financial transactions, the transparency of the ledger, the ability to go in uh, historical, uh, into historical background where you could have uh, uh, blockchain tied to uh, elements of spacecraft and things like that for tracking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the codification of communications using blockchain, all of that is absolutely you know, gonna be a part of it. Um, is there something that people in this room should be doing to map in blockchain with their space? Like, yeah, what, are, what are the actions? It. Studying, okay, great, what else? Uh, well, that's step one, all right? Okay. Because there is a misconception that blockchain equals Bitcoin. And that's, that's, not, uh, that's not correct. Or that there are the, the ICOs where people were basically uh, passing off securities uh, as some sort of special thing, uh, which they were basically just security you know, offerings. Um, there is- There was more hype than substance? This industry would never stand for that. It wasn't just hype, it was actually lies. Okay, okay. let's- so We love the SEC. And um, the fact is that um, there are you know, one of the very interesting things that you could do, I, I like, is the idea of applying uh, blockchain to the funding development and participation in the creation of human settlements in space. Where using blockchain, um, you could put in your, your intelligence, your knowledge, your supply, your capability to be part of the communal development of a settlement, and you would be tracked and your, your input into the development, intellectual, physical, uh, whatever, labor, anything, financial, could then be mapped using the ledger system of blockchain so that you would have fractional ownership and be a participant in the development, including the decision processes of a future colony in space um, as far as voting and things like this. So you would actually, it would be sort of the 21st century version of the Massachusetts Bay Company of the Pilgrims to where we're all funding together, participating in, owning, and receiving the benefit from 
Because again, with blockchain, you can track so many complicated interactions to the point where when the habitat is up there and you're producing, whether it's energy or selling tickets for visitors to the earth, all of that can be tracked simply, relatively simply, versus paper trails. The profit goes into the core of the community that you're all part of and you've actually put your effort into building and it all comes back out and you get to own a part of this place. So not an anarchist, a communist. And you're I what? Got Distributing a, words like communist I know, no, don't I, apply. I, I, I know, no, no, I know, no, I know, but I know, no, no, I'm, no. That's a, that's a. It's great. I love it. It's you know there are applications for it, but the fact is, when you start getting into things like blockchain in in uh, social financial systems, um, you you start trying to apply Marxist terminology or whatever to that. It doesn't really work. It changes or so, anarchism. It just doesn't you know, work. I, Go ahead. I, I can't give you a clear business opportunity, but your question brings up, uh, particularly the way you phrased it, makes me wonder if blockchain could not solve a market failure. And you mentioned that space is multi-generational. And you know, I've thought for a while, you know, it, it, if there were something like uh, uh, an organization like maybe the Space Frontier Foundation that was making investments that wouldn't pay off for a century, but I could somehow, you know, own a portion or control of that. Or, you know, an interesting question that I, or something that I've always thought is, as a, as a taxpayer, it's, I've always wished that, like, I personally could allocate my money in a particular, mm -hmm. like in a NASA budget, maybe I'm the guy who wants to fund manned exploration, or maybe I want to fund robots, or maybe I want to fund something else, right? If you can imagine, you know, like right now in government, there is no ability to crowdsource funding between agencies, right? So, uh, you know, today you, you can go on Kickstarter and propose a project and, you know, people can aggregate and when it goes, goes, right? There's really no way that you can do exactly that in the federal government. So if, you know, Dr. Moser and Air Force Space Command comes up with a great idea that they would only want to fund 10% of, and you'd want 10 from DOE and 10 from NASA. We don't really have an elegant way of doing that. Mm -hmm. But that could be a major you know, innovation. And then for things that some of us care a lot about, having monetary share and voting share in a subsection of the government, and there are some things that you know, we vehemently disagree about, and we're like, I don't want my tax dollars going to that. There's a possibility that you could fix this transaction problem uh, that, that, would, uh, that would liberate resources in, in novel ways and perhaps across generations where we can't, the market can't quite value and protect that in the way that, that we'd feel safe doing today. The other thing about space that ties into the, the blockchain beyond the sort of fancy answer I gave a minute ago um, is that once we get out there and we begin to establish settlements you know, I'm, I'm hoping to see those settlements just be like the states of the United States were uh, to, the, to the founders as, as crucibles uh, where you can try different ways of doing things. And I wouldn't be surprised to see variations of, of blockchain, social, financial technologies applied in different ways in some of these different communities as they pop up. And I should have known, a great way to incubate. Go ahead, I should have known better than to ask these two fine gentlemen a question about what are the boulders that are ahead of us because I think I heard hundreds of years some of the the, the I was thinking like making payroll is a boulder that's ahead of us but okay that's that is certain these are big things and big opportunities. Um, another what do you what, what do you got for us? A um, problem? A thing that's missing? Slight slight something. It's been a little bit overlooked. I guess, is um, the Polynesian culture in the Pacific is historically known as the most batshit tied to exploration and navigation and settlement, um, got to the farthest reaches of the earth before anyone else. How do we get to the point where right now in Hawaii, uh, native Hawaiians are being arrested so that a 30 meter telescope can be built on their sacred lands when we're 
all about aspirational exploration for all of humanity. How do we get here and what can we do about it? Is, is that the question of how do we pair our higher aspirations with the mechanics of governance? Any or sense? So, you know, I, I don't know if that was prompted. I, I put out a tweet <laughs> earlier about this because, uh, That's good. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I uh, spent part of my growing up years in, in Hawaii, and, and this, is, this problem has always deeply troubled me. Um, I, I think it, you know, identity and myth-making are very important, and it is a question of how, how something is interpreted, right? It, it would seem to me that, that interpreting that mission as sacred and in the tradition of, you know, the, the cultural hero and, and god Maui, right? Harness the sun to slow it down. The birds were invisible, and so he made them visible for humanity. He went and stole fire so that humanity could have fire, right? If Maui were still with us or active, he'd totally be on board with planetary defense. He'd totally be making the things that are invisible visible in terms of bringing fire uh, further on. So I think that this is the, the, the legitimate interpretation internal to the culture has not figured out that this is their commission and that they need to, they, they should choose to own that as their identity and, and move forward. Um, now whether or not that is possible with how it's already been framed, I don't know. I, I'm going to, do you mind? One second. Do it. Yeah, quick. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to move this. There ain't going to be nothing quick got, about it. We got, no, that's true. All right. So we got a few minutes left, and I really do appreciate the input, and I want to make sure that this is not just a one-time input, this is an ongoing input, an ongoing conversation. You are all part of advancing the human settlement of space. As we wrap up the fireside chat, what are the things that we know and we see here that aren't yet in the public consciousness, that haven't made their way out, that people don't quite understand? And I'll, I'll shum the waters with one of them, which is we believe broadly that lowering the price of launch is what commercial space is all about. It's all about, well, gosh, they're really driving down the price of launch, aren't they? But that misses. The real benefit is not the cost of launch. It is the pace of space. Mm -hmm. it, the benefit that comes from these new systems and new approaches and sometimes older technology applied in a new way, it's changing the way we go about using space, which changes the way we go about accessing space and changes the way we go about making space available to improve human life here. And I, I, I scream from the mountaintops about this, but people still think that, okay, well, that's great. The cost is lower, but everything else is still the same. Mm -hmm. And the small sats, the iPhoneization of satellites, has introduced a, a, a faster pace, but it's not pervasive throughout the industry. There are plenty of people that still plan to have a multi-year program with the same level of same number of nines and all the rest of it, and then they get to save a little bit of the total on launch. So changing, communicating how we are changing the pace of space is one of the things I think we as a community need to do. What do you think? What's, what are people missing? Uh, the big one that is going to hit us, and it's going to hit us really, really hard, um, is it's what I call the, and, and I mentioned this uh, to the Space Investment Symposium, and the, the, many people weren't here for that. Uh, I call it the Elysium effect. And the Elysium effect is the movie, you know, where the top 1% go out and build colonies in space, the ultimate gated communities in space, and screw the rest of you down here. So it's not a coincidence that some of the richest people on Earth are the ones funding our dream. And at the same time, what is happening is there is this debate or discussion rising up about control of the planet by the 1%. So here you have some very, very, very high profile, extremely wealthy people 
doing something we know and perceive of as being very benevolent and a gift to future generations. But what it really is doing, it's putting a great big target on them and our dream of opening the frontier using the technologies that they're funding as being the evil rich who are going to abandon the planet and go into space and leave the rest of us down here. And by the way, they're going to pump out a bunch of nasty gas on the way to get there. And there is a green wave rising out there. Um, and that green wave is, is it's this interesting thing, because at the same time, there's excitement about space, the younger generation, et cetera. We're handing them a basically fairly screwed up planet and saying, it's all yours, clean it up. And then that's getting rolled into some social agendas that say, and it's the 1% that did it, the leaders of these giant corporations such as Amazon. And then here's Jeff Bezos building the rockets. We need to open the frontier. And I believe that actually probably in the next five or 10 years, there's going to be this push. Because what is one of the most visible things these extremely rich people are doing? They're building rockets and they go into space. Oh, yeah. And once in a while, they get on and unfortunately follow the Twitter habits of our, the guy in the White House and say stupid stuff on Twitter and, and say stupid things about we're going to Mars and blah, blah, blah. So, so what is the thing that the public, so you're saying the public's perception. The public is, is, is perception. That the, the problem, you're saying that's not real, but the per problem yeah, is perception is reality. The and the perception okay. that the rich are going to move out into space and leave the rest of the people behind. You know, all it's going to take is uh, a, a single judge in some small court somewhere in Florida that some small social group that has decided that Elon Musk is evil to come in and file an injunction and stop the rockets flying for years, potentially. Because they don't understand, and we're not doing the greatest job possible, neither are they. And by the way, anybody here from Blue Origin or SpaceX needs to go back and tell their bosses they need to fund organizations like this who got them to where they are in the first place. Show a little they gratitude and strategy. Yeah. So, I, mean, so we I, I think you I hint get the at, message out. Sorry. Know, I think a few waves are about to crack uh, on the larger populace. Um, the first is, you know, it, probably most of you saw uh, Jeff Bezos unveil a blue moon. Mm -hmm. But if you haven't, this is one of the most important policy speeches given to the American public, right? He, it's not about Blue Moon. He establishes this multi-generational vision to build O'Neill colonies. And that and Elon have already had this effect where they, they have galvanized a, a huge coming social force and consciousness that this is a possibility. And that's going to have its own cultural effect that is going to weave its way into policy eventually. But it's also going to have a counter-reaction, and it's going to have an unfortunate counter-reaction based on identity. And we already see that with this labeling of his car as being you know, a midlife crisis and that we shouldn't. You know. So what I would say, right, and maybe I'm talking to you. Maybe you're one of them, right? Mm -hmm. What our community needs more than anything else is a powerful, non-white male voice on space settlement. A powerful non, because it is a different narrative, right? Settlement is about, right, children and giving birth and nurturance and taking things out. And it, and that, and having that come from a different identity, a different embodied presence is going to have a different effect and right now, our community is in tremendous danger mm -hmm. that the, these amazing ideals are going to be conflated with who's saying them, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's not what it's about, right? It, it is a much larger vision that can be owned by anybody. But not having that conflated is a big deal because there are people that want to, to make that conflation, right? Because they want to put down. There's a fundamentally anti-life movement out there that doesn't think humanity deserves to survive. They, they don't want 
us to stop the asteroid from burning us up. They think it is okay if the sun expands and fries us all and we don't have any future in space. They think we're so flawed and tainted that we should never leave the planet and we should let all of life just die in a few billion years. Intelligence, life, expression, consciousness, that is within the power of this community to give to all the dead worlds, to green the solar system, to garden the galaxy. And there is an anti-life agenda that wants to trap us in and label this as somehow maleficent and marauding and you know uh, exploitative. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it anti-life. I think it's just a, a group of people who don't understand what it is that we're offering. Um, I think in their way, they are hurt, saddened, disillusioned in terms of their, their ideals as to what humanity can be. And they're basically uninformed as to what it is we're offering uh, in terms of our ability to, you know, I, I like to say that we are, we're leaping over the environmental movement we're not just going to save this planet. We're going to take the seeds of life and spread them into the universe. Um, and, and, and that is a message we need to make sure that is put out into the world. Now, as to your messenger thing, I want to do two things. One, I want to thank Space Frontier Foundation for this event, because when I've looked around here, I will say that the, the male-female ratio is probably one of the highest I've seen. One of the best. One of the best that I've seen uh, in the space field. And I think you sh should be congratulated to you. Uh, when, we look at the, when we look at the board of directors, the advocates, the, uh, the other people in the organization, uh, I will put in a plug for New Worlds. We, have, uh, we publicly last week announced that half of our tickets are going to be given to women uh, to, to come to our conference, uh, which was a delicate conversation to have, but you have to get past the conversation into action. Amen. Um, say I that think again. We uh, need to be say it again. Pardon? What did you just say? It is a. You got to get past the conversation and into, into action. action. Say it again one more time. Past no, no. the conversation. Yeah. Into action. On this and anything else. And anything else. And we uh, we need to. I think you're exactly right. You know, um, we need to. It's not passing the torch. That's almost passive. We have to actively ignite the imaginations and the feeling of being able to contribute and participate and lead in other groups than those, this, this identity of I, I would also say, there. look, it's not about us opening the doors, right? We're hungry for it. Come steal the torch. Put, yeah. your, put yourself up in lights. You know, it, it, we're not gonna create that leader. They're gonna have to emerge out of their own passion. The other thing I would just say in terms of, of market opportunity or reality that I see shaping. Um, I, I think that, uh, as Dr. Moser said, right, this perception among nations that uh, the interstate competition is a big deal and that uh, they're going to compete and that space is the most important place to compete, uh, I think is actually the most beneficial thing that could happen for humanity. Because as much as I understand the sentiment behind cooperation, it is competition that moves us forward faster. So if we want to go faster, this is the, it, it is going to break on all the nations of the world as it already has that there's a new great game for, for space resources. And that is going to drive investment to everybody. It's going to make all of us move faster and faster. And ultimately, it's going to uplift all of humanity. And what is winning? Winning is when everybody gets to be free. When liberty is everywhere, that's the definition of winning. Go ahead. I'm, I'm blowing right past the stop sign. Don't even tell the cops. Closing thoughts. What are the things to charge? Uh, and I'm going to reserve impromptu moderator for saying something at the end. So give me just another, how much you want? A minute? Two? <laughs> Give me a minute to catch my breath. Um, really quickly, I, I yeah. think that one of the very important things that we need to understand is whatever happens now, let's have a race. Let's have a race. I love it when, when uh, rich people are like, you know, my, you know I, I'm going to go faster and further than you and all that. That's the race we want to see. Um, I, I like the fact that China is going to the moon and we're going to get up there and try and match them as long as that is done in economic 
scientific uh, and exploration terms. Um, and uh, what is really interesting to me is if we are successful, a couple of things are going to happen. Number one, throughout history, no matter who it was that sent a group of people to another place to live, or what government they came from, or who they represented it, one or two generations in, the people there basically look back at the people that sent them and say, you don't understand us. Screw you. We are of this place. Teenagers. And that's the hope. That's the hope. Because whether they are from China or Russia or the United States or wherever they come from, a couple of generations in, they're going to be Martians. They're going to be Lunarians. They're going to be free spacers. And they're going to go on their own anyway. So there is some hope in that. But the other last point I want to make is that as we get into this, like we deal with a lot of treaties and these kind of things that are between nation states and countries and all of this. At some point very soon, given the blockchain, given AI, given the ability to utilize resources, unlimited energy, all of these different things that will go into the creation of places where people can live, their homes in space, we're going to see the rise of people who are completely independent of the Earth. They can go out into space, renounce that they belong to any nation, and declare themselves to be independent. Families, companies, corporations, whatever it is, they're going to be tribes, May it churches. Pardon? May it happen. Yeah, you know, may it happen. And this is what I believe is, is a very hopeful, hopeful sign because some of these people are going to figure out a little bit better way to do things than we have down here so far. So I'll, I'll leave you all with what I think is a super simple commission. Probably there's nobody in this room that at some point in their life wasn't confronted with a word or phrase they used that somebody said, that's, that's insensitive, right? Or you, you've chosen the wrong word. And of course, the first time somebody says that to you, you're like, oh, right? But you adjust. You figure out what the new culture is and what's acceptable and not acceptable. So don't let anybody get away with saying the word presence. You say, you mean settlement, right? Because presence isn't enough. If they say exploration, you, you mean development, right? Exploration and development, right? Because exploration is, is not enough. Mm -hmm. And you always bring it back to scale. As we make this conversation extremely uncomfortable for NASA and for our elected leaders so that they can't talk in the same language that they talked in before, we will move forward the conversation and the policy towards the future we want to have. Don't let somebody just say exploration. You mean development. Don't let somebody say presence. You mean settlement. And don't let somebody say this is the goal. You say, what's your plan for scale? That's what we deserve from the government program we're paying for. Mm -hmm. My last thought here is as you have become part of the tribe become part of the church as you have taken on the insights and the inspiration from preachers like those up here today and from the folks that have been up on stage throughout the conference. You're part of that ecosystem now, and that is phenomenal, and we're very glad to have you. Keep coming. Know that you've got a home. We have got to take space beyond the space community. We cannot settle space if all we're doing is selling to each other. I call it giving each other space haircuts. Your charge in this next year is to go out and find those people who have things that they can benefit from this new way that space is done and drag them in. And I don't just mean someone that's building a rover. I mean people that are developing battery technology. I mean people that are trying to figure out how to grow new plants. I mean use space to make life better here and bring everyone else in so that space is not just a thing that we use. It's a thing that affects everyone. Barbers. Chefs, yes. fashion designers, architects, doctors, sanitation experts, blah, blah, Farmers. blah. Farmers. Everybody who makes this building and this community work 
has a place in space, no matter their gender, their type, their ethnicity, their origin, their ideology, what they look like, who they worship, where they come from, what they do as their day job. They are human beings, and this is all about humanity. Thank you all very and much all for being here. And all the species we'll take with us. Th thank you very much. The applause is for you. Thank you very much.